Good morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody. I'm really delighted to see you all here. Um, as the morning progresses, there's going to be some people uh, filtering in as uh, uh, we start. We're starting a little early than uh, some of the folks are prepared to show up. Uh, but uh, my name is Andrew Guzman. I'm the dean of the law school. And I want to, on behalf of the law school and the university, welcome all of you here. Uh, we are really delighted uh, that you're here. And we're delighted to have this conference. This is the second uh, annual conference for the Center for Transnational Law and Business. Uh, a center that is devoted, as its name suggests, to exploring uh, from both a practice perspective and a policy perspective uh, all things relevant to international business and international business law. We have a special focus uh, since our inception on matters of technology and antitrust, and that is reflected both in last year's conference and today's. The formal name of today, of course, is Application of Competition Policy on Technology and IP Licensing. We have a really terrific lineup of speakers, uh, some of the top people in the field, so I trust it will be uh, an informative and, and interesting day. Um, I'm going to get out of the way, but I do want to welcome you. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank uh, Brian Peck, the director of the center, um, and wish you all a terrific day. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our first panel on IP licensing and antitrust guidelines moderated by uh, Professor Jonathan Barnett. Thank you. I'd like to echo Dean Guzman's remarks. It's truly an honor uh, for me to be able to speak with so many prominent people in the field and from all around the world who are dedicated to uh, optimizing our regulatory structure for the world innovation economy. Our first panel is going to address IP licensing and antitrust guidelines, and it's going to give us a sort of contrast compare exercise to see how different leading jurisdictions uh, in the world, specifically uh, the US, China, and Japan, address IP issues within the antitrust regulatory framework. And I'll just briefly introduce our, our speakers. And then each speaker will present. We'll, um, uh, I'll be throwing out some questions to start our conversation going amongst the panelists. And then we'll open it up to the floor to whatever questions um, you may have. And just proceeding in order, um, on my left, we have Ian Connor from the Bureau of Competition at the US Federal Trade Commission. To his left, Gail Futan, professor of economics here at USC and Dornsife College, who will be speaking about Chinese antitrust policy. And to his left, Hiroyuki Odagiri from the Japan Fair Trade Commission. Ian, would you like to start? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, first, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I told Brian last night my mother is an uh, alum of USC, and I grew up about five miles from here. So it is always nice to have an opportunity to tell your mother that she, you are speaking at her alma mater. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> some disclaimers that I do have to make. Uh, the comments today that I will be um, presenting are not necessarily the uh, views of the Federal Trade Commission or any individual uh, commissioner. Uh, and one other note, I was not actually at the commission when the uh, guidelines that were released in January uh, came out, um, but subsequently came to the commission. So I cannot, um, for those of you who might have questions, I cannot give you kind of inside baseball on exactly what happened between uh, the latter half of 2016 and early 2017 uh, when we moved into the uh, issuance of the guidelines. So the uh, antitrust guidelines regarding intellectual property that were promulgated by the Justice Department and the FTC in the United States were released January 12th, 2017. Um, <clears throat> these guidelines were actually an update to the 1995 guidelines that were released during the Clinton uh, administration uh, jointly again by the, the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the guideline process was that they were released to, for public comment in August of 2016. They were then finalized and released uh, January 12th, as I said, uh, 2017. One notable um, uh, thing is that between the draft that came out in August and the final uh, guidelines, there were very minimal changes. There was quite a lot of commentary that came that was filed with the uh, commission in the Justice Department, but um, there were actually very <clears throat> minimal changes between the draft and the, uh, the final guidelines. So why are the guidelines relevant uh, for antitrust enforcement in the United States? And 
the, the key in the United States, and this has been recognized in courts, and you can see it in some of the footnotes within the IP guidelines, is one assumes there to be an inherent tension between the antitrust law, which favors competition, and patent rights, which favors exclusivity and providing uh, de facto at least monopolies in certain uh, segments for a period of time. But if you look back, and this tension has been debated over and over again, but if you look back really antitrust and uh, patent rights and uh, intellectual property rights more broadly are actually quite complementary. <clears throat> excuse me, complementary. Back in 2003, uh, the Assistant Attorney General at the time, Hugh Pate, uh, discussed this apparent tension, uh, noting that at the time the 1995 guidelines, which were in effect, actually acknowledged this complementarity and <clears throat> that the guidelines themselves cited multiple cases showing that there's not a lot of tension, but rather that they work in conjunction because there are property rights that you want to protect in IP that is no different than the property rights you want to protect for ownership of factories or ownership of uh, other assets. And so those guidelines did not carve, really carve off a different um, set of rules for intellectual property rights than you would see sitting for um, any physical assets. Um, that same core principle uh, is, continues to be the, the main tenet of the uh, updated guidelines. There's still um, acknowledgments of a, a claimed tension between IP rights and patent rights, but the, when they did the update, they again reaffirmed that IP rights do not require any separate set of rules. Uh, they don't require any different treatment from other property rights. What the guidelines do is provide a framework for how the uh, antitrust authorities will go through and analyze different um, structures, especially licensing structures, when you don't have a physical plant, when you don't have something you can see, because these things can be licensed to five, six, seven different people at the same time, which is not something you see in a physical property right. So why was the uh, update actually undertaken? So it had been two decades, uh, actually 22 years, uh, when the guidelines finally came out. Uh, and there had been quite a number of Supreme Court cases that had come down. There had been uh, a clamoring for guidance on certain types of property rights, uh, especially um, standard essential patents. And they wanted to capture the, the developments in thinking, uh, both from the courts and from the agencies, especially embodied in the horizontal merger guidelines, which the agencies had jointly released in 2010, uh, and then take into account the, the Supreme Court precedent that did change some of the, the uh, tenets that had been uh, presented in the 1995 guidelines while enforcing uh, some of the other uh, tenets. But if you look at the 1995 guidelines versus the uh, 2017 guidelines, there actually are very minimal changes. There, there are some things that have been removed, but overall it actually was not a significant uh, departure from the 1995 guidelines uh, positions. So I mentioned the Supreme Court precedents that had come down from the U.S. Supreme Court during the, the period between 1995 and 2017. Uh, the big one for my agency was FTC v. Activists. Uh, this is a pay-for-delay case. It was decided in 2013. Um, this was a case that the FTC had been bringing a number of patent settlement challenges against branded pharmaceutical companies over the course of probably about 10 years. Um, and they repeatedly lost until finally they got a circuit split between the 11th and the 3rd Circuit Court of Appeals in the United States, uh, which allowed them to take that to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ended up siding with the FTC finding that what was called the scope of the patent test, meaning if you did a any sort of license within the scope of your patent, say your patent went out to 2020, and you allowed entry any time before uh, 2020, then you should be fine under whatever the settlement is you were negotiating. But what the Supreme Court said is where someone, in this case a generic uh, pharmaceutical company, is challenging your patent, and you agree as the brand to say, I'll let you in in 2019, and in return for not challenging my patent, I'll also hand over about $100 million. What they said is, you can't pay, you can't exchange something of value for foregoing a patent challenge, because then it starts to look a lot less like just a standard licensing agreement, 
and a lot more like an anti-competitive uh, agreement between a potential competitor and a uh, market participant. So activists um, was incorporated, you'll see a footnote in the uh, US uh, IP guidelines. Um, another case that came down from the Supreme Court is the Legion case. Uh, it's PSKS uh, v. Legion. Uh, when the 1995 guidelines were promulgated, the Dr. Miles precedent had been uh, embodied in the case law for, I think, uh, about 80 years. Um, the Dr. Miles precedent was actually reversed in Legion. And when I talk about Dr. Miles, it's a Supreme Court case that held that resale price maintenance so uh, if you are selling a product to a distributor or to a retailer uh, and you say you can only sell this product for $5 or higher, um, that under the Dr. Miles jurisprudence was per se illegal. There was no efficiency justification, nothing. If you showed an RPM, then it was per se illegal. Legion reversed that. Legion said that you would apply the rule of re reason analysis, which is the, the bulk of what we do in antitrust, is we apply the rule of reason analysis and balance the pro-competitive benefits of the licensing arrangement or the resale price maintenance arrangement with any potential anti-competitive effects. They did not say that all RPM is per se legal, but they said you have to engage in a balancing test. And so that has now, what used to be in the guidelines as a per se illegal conduct has now been removed and you can have a rule of reason analysis for resale price maintenance that is contained in a uh, IP license uh, going forward. Um, there are two cases uh, that are in the same kind of vein, uh, Trinco, v, uh, Verizon v. Trinco, and then Linkline. Um, both of these cases stood for the proposition that you are not required to deal with your competitor. You can unilater unilaterally decide that you will not deal with your competitor. This actually was a tenant that was already in the, uh, the IP guidelines in 1995, but you now had two Supreme Court cases validating that. Similarly, another case out of the U.S. Supreme Court was Illinois Tool. Illinois Tool said that um, you will not presume market power simply because the party holds a patent. Um, that was also a uh, position that was held in the guidelines in 1995, but the Supreme Court adopted that position in Illinois Tool, and it has now been um, reinforced within the, the uh, updated guidelines. So what is the rationale for the guidelines themselves? I've talked about the fact that we, we had to update them for different cases that, that have come down, but um, the acting assistant attorney general at the time that they were promulgated in 2017, uh, Renata Hesse, noted that the guidelines have, quote, played a key role in the department's investigative enforcement and guided businesses and courts, having been cited in numerous opinions in government briefs. She noted that the principles and the guidelines have been uh, reaffirmed over and over again. And what is telling about the 2017 guidelines is they are a validation of the validity of <clears throat> the original um, 1995 guidelines. That's why she said that you don't see a very dramatic change because there wasn't a need for that. Um, and the current acting chairman of the FTC, she was a, a commissioner at the time that the, the, uh, the updated guidelines came out, but she's now the acting chairman. Uh, similarly applauded the guidelines for their flexibility. I mean, one of the things is, I mean, you, if you look at the horizontal merger guidelines, if you look at the coll competitor collaboration guidelines, any of the guidelines that come out of the two agencies jointly, they are built to be very flexible and not to bind either the um, parties or the government into any specific treatment of a certain set of circumstances. They, like the guidelines for IP have examples that are meant to guide businesses and especially businesses outside council on how they may be treated, but there's always going to be flexibility built into the guidelines because you can't assume what the world's going to look like and you can't take into account, especially um, five, six, seven years down the road, what you may be dealing with. And so um, the current acting chairman of the FTC uh, noticed that, um, or excuse me, commented uh, that this flexibility reaffirmed the important propositions that one, IP laws grant enforceable property rights in the United States, and those enforceable property rights have social value. Uh, she stated that the guidelines observe the that the antitrust laws do not impose a liability, as I said, for unilateral conduct. This is the Trinco case. Um, she noted that IP licensing itself is generally viewed as pro-competitive, so there is not a presumption that 
uh, the fact that you're licensing with a competitor or with somebody else is going to be anti-competitive um, <clears throat> in line with um, the Illinois tool case uh, the commissioner said excuse me the, the chairman said uh, that these guidelines um, do not uh, bestow market power so I've talked about kind of how they developed uh, the key points in the the guidelines uh, that I just wanted to touch briefly on um, are the fact that <clears throat> they reaffirm the fact that there's no special rules that apply to IP rights. If you go through the guidelines, you will see discussions of exclusive dealing. You will see the discussions of licensing and cross-licensing. But these are concepts that you can find in other um, uh, joint venture case law and other uh, licensing of rights. So th they made a very clear statement that IP rights are just another property right. Um, what got left out? So I mentioned standard essential patents. Um, there was a lot of clamoring heading into the, the drafting of the guidelines and in the comment period between when it was issued and when uh, it was finally promulgated over standard essential patents. These are patents that tend to be franned and encumbered, meaning uh, they are required, they've been incorporated into a standard and they are required to be licensed on FRAND, which stands for Fair and Reasonable Non-Discriminatory uh, terms, uh, what FRAND is, what that rate should be, how it should be calculated. These are all things that are very much up in the air, and the courts are actually trying to decide that right now. Uh, and that's one, I, I don't know for a fact, but if I had to guess, that's one of the reasons that um, they were not incorporated into the guidelines, because there's, the courts are dealing with this issue now. Do you deal with, um, how do you deal with royalty stacking? Uh, how do you deal with, do you look at the smallest saleable unit, meaning if you have a Wi-Fi um, patent that's incorporated into a chip that is then incorporated into a tablet, um, do you base your royalty on the Wi-Fi value of the tablet, or Wi-Fi value of the chip, or Wi-Fi or the the value of just the the patent itself? And so these are all questions that are currently being uh, litigated throughout the courts, um, and <clears throat> the guidelines themselves did not uh, decide to weigh in on these uh, issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the last thing I want to point, on, or point to is something that did come uh, into these guidelines that had not really been addressed in the last, uh, the 1995 guidelines, and that is the concept of international comedy. Uh, so if you look at the introduction to the guidelines, um, they talk about taking into account the fact that we now live in a very global marketplace, and we have to deal with the fact that IP licensing rights typically are not limited to a certain jurisdiction. And so they said, look, we are going to take into account um, the fact that you have global licensing, but if there is a sufficient nexus in the United States, we will look at those uh, licensing schemes and we will apply the U.S. antitrust laws to them. That said, they then went on to say, but we will take into account the role of international comedy and the role of foreign governmental institutions when deciding whether or not to enforce uh, the patent rights under the U.S. Uh, antitrust laws. So I think if you're looking for kind of an overarching uh, position to, to look at in the, the guidelines, you can look back to a, a U.S. Supreme Court case called Brunswick v. Pueblo Bolomat, um, which is a fantastic name. Um, the, that's the case that where the Supreme Court set out a very now standard U.S. position of antitrust law, and that is the antitrust laws protect competition, not competitors. And so what they're looking at, when we look at the guidelines, and we, when we choose enforcement actions, we are looking at ensuring that IP rights are licensed in a way and used in a way that are pro-competitive, or at least neutral. We are not trying to protect any specific set of competitors. We are trying to ensure consumer welfare is enhanced. The acting uh, FTC Chairman Olhausen touted in speeches uh, the value of protecting these IP rights because she walks through the fact that by giving companies very strong IP rights, <clears throat> it gives them an incentive to invest in innovation. If they know that the, those IP rights are going to be um, abrogated in fairly short order, then what incentive do they have in spending large amounts of money on research and development when <clears throat> whatever comes out of that research development, maybe the value of it may be gone in a couple of years. So the, it's very important to protect those IP rights 
and allow them to, to actually reap the benefits of the R&D investment that they've made. On mergers specifically, um, again, the, the guidelines don't look at IP rights any differently, and that means that also in mer the merger context, IP rights should not be looked at differently from other property. If you have an um, overlap between products and there is an anti-competitive effect, it makes sense to remedy that. But IP rights, because they are much more easily licensed and, and transferred, um, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should start transfer, using the merger laws to transfer them out to other companies to enhance competitors' rights because they may not have those IP rights. You want to make sure that the, the, uh, the incentives remain the same for keeping the, uh, the strong IP rights within the companies that have developed them. And just because they're engaging in a merger, unless it's an, it raises any trust issues, you should not take the merger as an advantage or an opportunity, I should say, to go forward and require licensing of IP rights that would not otherwise have to be licensed. So I, <clears throat> I'll conclude by saying um, the guidelines make clear that the anti-competitive activity uh, involving IP rights will be challenged under the U.S. antitrust laws, but that IP rights otherwise are viewed as an enhancement to consumer welfare by encouraging innovation and protecting competition by enhancing <clears throat> their, the um, entity's incentives to actually put money into R&D, put money into development of new products, and to bring those new products to the, uh, the consumers. So. Yeah. Thank you very much for those remarks. Um, we'll move on to Professor Tan from USC, who, as I mentioned, will be speaking about Chinese antitrust policy in the IP area. I'll just stand up. Yeah, great. Okay, um, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank Brian and uh, Andrew for um, putting this program together. It's good to be here. And uh, just to uh, follow your recommendation, I'll just discuss uh, uh, antitrust guidelines in the context of uh, IP protection. And um, Ying has just gave a uh, very good uh, discussion about uh, US uh, antitrust guidelines. What I'm gonna do is to just um, compare the Chinese antitrust guidelines with the US one uh, and um, make a few uh, comments based on my limited understanding as uh, some of the guidelines are still work in progress. Uh, let me first just uh, um, Which direction it goes? Oh, here we go. Um, I'd like to just emphasize that, um, uh, which Yin also pointed out, um, there's a strong complementarity between competition and um, IP protections. And there has been a lot of studies in economics literature, uh, particularly there's a recent paper or a few years ago by economist Daniel Spober from uh, Northwestern University. Uh, essentially, he has shown that uh, in, in, in a more general theoretical economic model, um, without sufficient IP protection, uh, competition might not uh, accomplish the, the usual um, objectives as, uh, as we would expect. On the other hand, uh, if you have strong IP protection, and then competition would help to competition in both, uh, both invention market and also product market, that would help to uh, uh, encourage innovation as well as uh, enhancing consumer welfare. So in that sense, the, uh, the, the, the two parts are, are com complementary. Um, as, as we have been discussing, I, intellectual property law provides uh, strong incentives for, for uh, innovation. One thing I'd like to mention here is that uh, there's a large literature in economics showing uh, innovation incentives, uh, what determines innovation in incentives, and uh, also, well, under what conditions, what kind of optimal, optimal license contracts should be. Now, this is uh, very important in the following sense. When we investigate, for example, abuse of dominance in the context of uh, intellectual properties, sometimes we do see very complex license contracts. And uh, once you grant monopoly rights to uh, IP holders, and the monopolist would try to design the best mechanism to get return. So those mechanisms might be depend on a fixed fee, two per tariff, 
or conditional on many other instruments that you could enforce. So, so we have to take into account asymmetric information, moral hazard issues, and uh, 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 other, uh, other factors. So, so in some sense, when you see a contract royalty based on certain observable instrument, even if it's um, downstream product uh, sales, so, so it, it is not surprising. It, it, it is a, a, a mechanism design problem based on a number of factors. So there's a large literature studying this. So this can be uh, relevant in the context of uh, antitrust enforcement. Um, on the other hand, you know, as, as we understand the competition law, antitrust law would help us to um, accomplish similar objectives and so on. So in that sense, because competition IP protections are complements and therefore the two sets of uh, policies, laws, are also complementary. So, so in that sense, um, that, that's why we're, we're, we're discussing here. But um, since IP license arrangements are typically welfare enhancing and uh, can be pro-competitive, in certain cases, um, abuse or, or um, antitrust, other antitrust concerns can arise. That's why we need a set of uh, guidelines for different parties to uh, follow. So uh, this is where we uh, are, are discussing. So as Ying has discussed, there's a, a set of antitrust guidelines uh, issued by uh, jointly by the Department of Justice and the FTC just uh, a few months ago. And uh, similarly, there's a set of guidelines issued by the uh, Anti-Monopoly Commission of the State Council in China. So uh, as we're aware, there are three anti-monopoly enforcement agencies, NDRC, Opcon, and uh, SAC, and there's a commission sitting on the top. Uh, commission is mostly responsible for coordinating and also uh, uh, designing uh, general principles, guidelines, and so forth. So this particular guideline, for instance, is issued by the state um, anti-monopoly commission of the state council. So the most recent draft is um, uh, March 23rd uh, this year. So still uh, uh, a call for, for, for comments. So if you have read some of the uh, uh, provisions, uh, articles, and if you have some comments, feel free to send to the relevant um, uh, place. So, so, so let me just uh, mention that um, once this set of guidelines is formally approved, it will apply, it will be, uh, uh, essentially all three agencies will follow the set of guidelines, okay? So wh what I'm gonna do uh, today is just uh, discuss a few points in terms of uh, common features between the two guidelines and also the differences, okay? And um, so the first thing I'd like to just mention that the general objectives between the two guidelines are reasonably consistent. For instance, the principles of uh, Nanases and the Chinese guidelines are, are stated as, uh, just as you also discussed, we just treat intellectual property as the same as other property when we enforce antitrust law and the monopoly law. However, we should take into account the specific features of uh, intellectual property. So, so uh, that, that's uh, well uh, emphasized, especially in terms of scope and in terms of nature of the property. So obviously that depends on the context of uh, intellectual property. And also, it is recognized, although the intellectual property rights are an exclusive right, uh, a company or undertaking should not be presumed to be in dominance in the relevant, mar relevant market. So, so in that sense, uh, this, this is the general principle that uh, the agency are expected to, to follow. Okay? Um, so uh, when I look at the Chinese guidelines, the, 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 um, the structure, the coverage, is pretty much similar to the U.S. guidelines. So typically you have this general analytical framework that is well laid out in the, in, in the guidelines. And uh, there's a common first important step that is to define relevant market, which we'll, I will discuss in the next uh, few minutes. And then uh, the Chinese guideline also set up a set of uh, factors, conditions that will help, will cons be considered in terms of accessing pro-competitive effects of the practice and also uh, anti-competitive effects. So the pro-competitive pro effects here essentially is uh, 
you know, when you have uh, intellectual property, you have innovation, and uh, uh, those, there, there are certain uh, practices that will help to encourage innovation, and those are the uh, positive ones that also uh, should be uh, considered, okay? And, uh, and then the rest of it is just like um, antitrust law. Essentially, you talk about monopoly agreements associated with IP rights, so there's a special chapter on that. And uh, there's a special chapter on the abuse of dominance in the context of IP rights. And the one thing I should mention here is that uh, in this particular chapter, the Chinese guideline did emphasize, did talk about the um, standard essential patents, SEP, which, um, which US guideline uh, does not seem to mention this uh, special area, but, but we'll, we'll discuss later. And of course, there's also uh, merger reviews associated with IP rights. So I think uh, Dr. Wang will discuss uh, yeah, in, in the afternoon. So this is the general coverage. I think they're pretty much similar. Um, on the other hand, um, there's one thing I like to emphasize as compared to the standard antitrust enforcement guideline, that is uh, defining relevant markets in the context of IP rights is very important. And um, so he, here, in both guidelines, US and the Chinese one, the, in addition to the product market definition, they emphasize the technology market, and possibly research and the development market. And the reason is that intellectual property could be used to produce a downstream product. And the intellectual property itself and a downstream product market, well, products, are separate or together, it can make a difference in some particular cases. Uh, for, for instance, if you, if you have intellectual property, you have a patent, and uh, this patent is used to produce another product. Should those two be separate? Well, if, if they're all together, you cannot accuse a company of double dipping. If they are together, you cannot talk about uh, bundling. So, so in, in some sense, uh, if, you, if you discuss bundling, double, or in, in, in some sense, is it two, are those two products, okay? So to what extent technology and the product itself are separate markets, that depends on, you know, whether this technology will be used in other contexts or, or, or just for this part. In, in, in other words, those two are almost perfectly complementary or perfect complements. Uh, among other factors. So, so, so essentially, the technology markets, which is the IP that under consideration, uh, or that is licensed and is close substitute, this is sort of a special feature as compared to the standard antitrust uh, enforcement for, for like grocery products or, or uh, and so on. So, and uh, moreover, Sometimes we might have to consider research and the development market in the sense that if by merely considering technology markets and product markets would not uh, uh, help us to understand the positive and negative e effects on research and development. So in that kind of situation, we might have to consider research and development markets separately. And this can be very important for, for, for innovation. So, so that, that is a special feature. Uh, from my point of view, that both guidelines have emphasized uh, in, the, in the prominent place. So, so this is uh, uh, interesting. And the other uh, a point I was reading to guidelines uh, is that um, the Chinese guidelines tend to be very abstract, very brief. And uh, every point seems to uh, mean a lot of things. And on the other hand, the US guideline provides more illustrating examples more footnotes to elaborate what we mean by, for example, technology markets. Uh, it has a long page of uh, example to describe. Uh, it, it essentially, I understand a lot about the um, you know, importance of technology markets. So, so in that sense, um, uh, I, I think examples, footnotes, elaborations do help uh, readers to understand the point of the guideline. And, but on the other hand, being very brief does give uh, agencies a lot of flexibility. So uh, there's pros and cons, obviously. But, but as, as a piece of guidelines, it's, it's probably good to provide a little more detail for, for readers to, to, to follow. Anyway, that's one point that uh, I, I thought would be uh, it, it's interesting to, 
differentiate. And uh, uh, here we go. This is, uh, this is an important one, that is excessive pricing. Okay? <laughs> to some extent, excessive pricing is quite unique um, uh, 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 between the two guidelines in, in the Chinese context. So, so uh, essentially, what is uh, standard? What is considered um, a, a f for, for a price to be excessive? Okay? If you do grant IP holder a monopoly right, and uh, the monopoly will just charge price based on demand, cost, and uh, uh, other factors, okay? I could charge royalty based on a bunch of instruments that I can enforce. So to what extent that's excessive? And actually there are some cases uh, uh, previously regarding this uh, provision, okay? And on the other hand, US guidelines do not mention anything about uh, uh, excessive pricing. Even as, as I mentioned earlier, not about friend and uh, other commitment made uh, uh, by, by license source. So, so that, that is a, a, a special feature. But, but it seems to me that what is excessive, perhaps to some extent you try to find some benchmarks. Okay, so to some extent is, uh, is an issue related to price discrimination. If you charge a price low in one region, in one area, but high price in another region, another area without sufficient justification, uh, that seems to be suspicious. But of course, you know, price discrimination has another, there's another provision under anti-monopoly law that specifies, that mentions the price discrimination. So there's a, there's a uh, little bit of ambiguity here in terms of um, benchmarking standards and uh, how to enforce this provision. So that's an that's, uh, uh, interesting point. And um, other issues, I think, uh, in terms of safe harbor, when, it's come, when it comes to uh, monopoly agreement, uh, the Chinese guidelines do differentiate competitors versus non-competitors. In other words, a licensed store and licensee, if they are the horizontal competitors, then the market share requirement uh, together is about 20%, which is similar to the US guideline. But if you are vertically related, then, uh, then uh, the, the, sh the market share is uh, 30% threshold in each of the relevant markets. So there's a little bit uh, refined differentiation in the uh, Chinese guideline context. So that might be uh, helpful. Um, other issues, I think there's another, yeah, uh, uh, let's just summarize. I, I think the, the point, the, the principle that we all understand the incentives derived from intellectual property protection and from competition are the primary and the complementary uh, motivators for, for, for innovation. That's something that we all agree on. And the policy goal is to promote an environment in which inventors have proper incentives and reward, well, consumers can benefit from the innovation. Those, those are the objectives. The, the, the challenge here is, uh, in some sense, when we enforce IP laws and enforce antitrust laws, how do we keep the right balance? It, this is uh, our, our challenge, that's why we're discussing today. So, so in particular, when we enforce antitrust laws, we need to take into account the special features uh, and uh, different products, different industries tend to differ. Well, I have been learning a lot myself from reading the two sets of guidelines, and I think uh, these books are very helpful. And uh, it, 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 it's clear that the, the different jurisdictions, Chinese agencies, have been uh, in the same pace as the other, particularly US agency, in terms of uh, enforcement, design guidelines com for comments, and so on. And of course, you know, for those of you who have worked on cases, I, I think what matters is detail. So, um, so we'll see how, how, how it goes. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Our last presenter will be Mr. Odagiri of the Japan Fair Trade Commission, and after that we'll open it up for discussion. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's quite a pleasure that I could uh, come here and join uh, all the distinguished uh, speakers in here and talk about the Japanese uh, commission policy. Uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, better that I clarify my own position at the JFTC uh, before uh, starting the discussion. 
I was a commissioner of the Japan Fair Trade Commission from 2012 to until last year. Uh, but I did retire, and now I have the title of the special advisor to uh, the JFTC. And the, uh, so in that sense, uh, I'm not involved in any of the decision makings at uh, JFTC uh, at this moment. So uh, what I'm going to speak today, uh, you should not take it as an, uh, more, uh, a kind of official statement from uh, the JFTC. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I also have to say that the, uh, before becoming the commissioner, I used to I'd be a, a professor of economics, that like Professor Tan, uh, for many years, teaching in many universities, both in the United States and in Japan. So uh, I would like to start from a certain economic discussions of the standard essential patents, SEP. Uh, now, the, perhaps uh, many of you are very familiar with this uh, discussion, but uh, in terms of the IP licenses, particularly in relation to standard decisional patents, there are a number of difficulties. And uh, the two main difficulties, I think, are the first is the start royalty stacking and the tragedy of anti-commons. Uh, that is, uh, in any standard, uh, in, I mean, most standards, I should say, the now, uh, hundreds or possibly thousands of patents are involved in there. They are, of course, uh, regarded as the so-called essential patents. And, and in, to make uh, one product, let's say personal computers or smartphones, uh, possibly more than 100 standards are involved in there. That means when you want to produce and sell those products, you have to clear uh, thousands of uh, patents, the, the rights of those uh, patents to uh, get any uh, permission to produce and sell those products. So uh, if each of those uh, patent holders require a certain uh, very big uh, license fees, then that would make the total royalty payment to be prohibitively large. And that is a problem of royalty stacking. And then uh, if this royalty stacking takes place, then the commercial development of the product is uh, now becomes very difficult to do. It's become very unprofitable. So uh, because of this uh, phenomenon, if the commercial development does not take place, then everyone would suffer. The consumers would suffer from not being able to enjoy those uh, products. Uh, producers will not be able to gain profit from making them, and the patent holders will not get any license revenue at all. So uh, that is uh, what's called the tragedy of anti-commons, because the, if the, those uh, uh, technical knowledge are put in the, the commons so that everyone can use that, then the, the product development will take place, but because uh, everything, every patent is uh, uh, held as a private license and ownership, the, the development will not take place. That is the tragedy of anti-commons. The second difficulty is what's called the holder problem. That is, uh, uh, you know, the, the holder problem is a common phenomenon in industrial organization or in commission policy that, the, like, uh, demanding uh, the exorbitant royalty payment after the, after the, the producers making uh, any investment in what's called the sunk assets, then the, it's called the holder problem. And because those uh, licenses have already made a big uh, investment and will not be able to recover that kind of cost, then we have to get the patents at any cost, and that makes the patent holders to be in a very uh, uh, advantageous bargaining position. And that is the holder problem. So uh, these uh, problems can take place easily, in, particularly in relation to standard decisional patents. 
and mainly to solve those problems, the two uh, devices, two mechanisms have been considered. One is the patent pool and the other is the f declaration. Uh, patent pool is an efficient device for saving transaction cost and also for setting an aggregate royalty at a reasonable rate. So uh, in, 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 in that sense, it's a, quite a very uh, useful, convenient tool. But uh, the outside, outsider problem can be serious because if you stay as an outsider to the pool, then you have a very good uh, bargaining power for getting big licenses. Uh, because of that, uh, it is now more common to have the, the system for f round declaration. Uh, so many of those uh, standard setting organizations, SSOs, require the owners of the essential patents to uh, disclose their essential patents and then make the, and require those uh, patent holders to make the, what's called f round declaration, which is a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, uh, rate. So, so the, it, it is now common that all those uh, patent holders declare that they would, once the, the standard is uh, accepted, they would license on the f round term. But obviously, it is often difficult to uh, get an agreement within the license and licensee about what is the reasonable rate, what is a fair rate. Uh, so uh, it is creates a lot of uh, difficulties often. And also, it is also the both over declaration and, and under declaration can take place. Over declaration means that the, the patent owners tend to declare that their patents are essential patents, even though it may not, they, those patents may not be exactly essential to uh, that standard. Under declaration may also occur in that the patent holders may be tempted to stay outsiders to those uh, uh, SSO and then declare a, a, a very big uh, royalty. So uh, in that sense, there is a room for competition policy to solve those uh, difficulties and to uh, make the transaction more uh, useful and more uh, advantageous to both license holders and uh, licensees. Now, in Japan, uh, we now have uh, two guidelines related to this issue. The one uh, guideline is called the, basically about the uh, stand, patent pool, standardization and patent pool. And then we have another uh, guideline on IP license, and that is more widely covering the issues. And now in last year, we did revise the, the second guideline to include a uh, couple of uh, paragraphs related to this effluent uh, licensing uh, scheme. So uh, let me just speak uh, very briefly about those uh, two uh, guidelines. The first one is about this, uh, the, the guidelines on standardization and patent pool arrangements. Uh, which was uh, made in 2005 and was revised two years later. And in here, I just go two paragraphs. And the first paragraph here that I'm citing here uh, discusses that the patent pool can be pro-competitive. Pro uh, you will see that the, it says, putting patents for specification is an effective means of granting the necessary licenses efficiently. <coughs> and adjusting the license fees so that they do not become excessive when some. So it says that it, in this way, putting patents encourages competition by facilitating the production of marketing new products. So in that sense, the guidelines admit uh, the pro-competitive, the possibility of uh, pro-competitive effects of those uh, patent pools, even though patent pools is in, in a sense an uh, um, agreement between possibly uh, competitors. Um, but in the, in the same guideline, it also says that the, uh, in, however, in the licensing agreements through a pool, 
imposing different conditions on specific businesses without due course, such as refusing to license the patents, <coughs> requiring extremely high licensing fees, uh, etc., is at risk of violating the Anti-Monopoly Act when such activities have a direct and serious impact on the incumbent functions of licensees that are suffering discrimination. Uh, so uh, we have not had uh, many uh, cases uh, related to this issue, but a very well-known case uh, took place uh, actually uh, before the guidelines started in 1997, 20 years ago. It is called the Pachinko Machine Patent Pool case. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with Pachinko machines, but uh, some of you perhaps have come to Japan and see those, uh, uh, the patching, the patching things. Uh, let me see. Like that? Sorry. <laughs> For your fun, I, I, I have uh, put some pictures in here. These are the Pachinko machines, OK? <laughs> And uh, uh, if you go come to uh, Japan in Tokyo or wherever, you will some uh, uh, what's called the pachinko parlors, a big uh, playing game places. And in those parlors, you will see that uh, hundreds of those machines are in the in the parlor, and you can just play there. And but you will see that. Uh, this, I think, was uh, uh, probably 50, 60 years ago. And now you have this, uh, this kind of more, more sophisticated <laughs> and elect <laughs> electronized uh, pachinko machines. So you will see that the um, many patents are actually involved in these days for the, the machines. Uh, even at, at the moment of this case, in 1997, uh, I heard that the more than 2,000 uh, patents were involved in the, the making pachinko machines. And in this case, the, uh, the pachinko machine manufacturing was an uh, oligopolistic industry with something like uh, 10 producers. And they created, jointly created, the patent pool, pachinko machine patent pool. Uh, and then what they did was uh, to allow licensing among each other, but not to new entrants. Okay? And that is why uh, the JFTC took uh, um, action to that and uh, decided that it is an, a violation of the Anti-Monopoly Act. So in that sense, uh, it says that the, you know, in here, such as refusing to license the patents, you know, and creating the uh, serious impact on the competing functions of licensees and so forth, that applied quite well to this uh, particular case. And that is why we did take an action. Now, the other uh, guidelines uh, in here, JFTC's guidelines for the use of intellectual property, uh, that started in 2007, but it was revised just last year. And the revision was made to uh, make an explicit discussion on uh, standard uh, essential patents and on the, those affront uh, commitments things. So in here, it said that the refusal to license or bringing an action for injunction against a party who is willing to take a license by an affront encumbered standard essential patent holders may fall under the exclusion of business activities of other entrepreneurs by making it difficult to research and develop, produce or sell the products adopting the standards. And therefore, it may constitute, uh, it may violate the provision of the, what's called private monopolization in the, the Japanese uh, Anti-Monopoly Act. Uh, now, Obviously, what's most difficult about this thing is uh, whether the party is actually as willing to take a license or not. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the guideline this does set, uh, this make a certain discussion about uh, this uh, 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 interpretation of the willing licensees. And it basically it said that the, uh, it 
whether a party is a willing licensee or not should be judged based on the stage of each case uh, in light of the behavior of both sides and so forth. And like, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, and in here, for example, whether the, there's a presence or absence of the present in, in infringement designating the part and the spacing the way in which it is infringed. The second is the presence or absence of the offer for license on the conditions specifying its reasonable base. Uh, the third, the correspondence attitude, correspondence attitude the offer such as prompt and reasonable counter offers. Uh, and then whether or not the parties undertake licensing negotiation in good faith. Those, you know, considerations are listed in the, 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 uh, the guideline, but, you know, but uh, actually it's, it's often, you will see that it's often quite difficult to apply this uh, judgment to a particular case. Um, so, uh, uh, we have had uh, very few actual cases uh, at the JFTC involving those uh, uh, standard decision patents and uh, the, the EFRAN commitment. Uh, in the afternoon session, uh, uh, I, I plan to give uh, a discussion of uh, just a couple of examples that took place in Japan, but uh, we will understand that the, the the decision of how to, to decide whether this particular license is a uh, willing license or not is uh, uh, often very very difficult. And I think this is not the, the case in Japan, but in all in all countries in the world. So uh, let me just uh, stop here by saying that the you know. Uh, there is a room for competition policy to be involved in those cases related to standard essential patents, uh, but the actual implementation of the policies can be often quite, quite difficult. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to start by uh, exercising my moderator's privilege and taking one question for myself. Uh, and then I'll, I have some more, but I'll, I'll save the others. Uh, and I'll then open it up for uh, questions from the audience, uh, which is, of course, highly encouraged and welcomed. So I was doing compare contrast myself here, being someone who I think is uh, fairly well informed about US antitrust law, but fairly uninformed about Chinese and Japanese uh, antitrust law. And what got my Chicago school red flags going is that when I hear uh, the ability or the possibility of bringing an antitrust cause of action based on the determination or perception that pricing is excessive, that a patent is being used in a, in a uh, is being abused. Right? Th those are concepts that are hard to reconcile with decisions like the Trinco decision, which was mentioned, which uh, impose, recognizes no duty to deal, no unilateral duty to deal that even says that the one case in which the Supreme Court ever recognized unilateral duty to deal, Aspen skiing, is at the outer boundary of antitrust law. And the question I have specifically, uh, I think, for um, our colleagues who are experts in Chinese and, and Japanese antitrust law is specifically um, the following. When you, when you say an antitrust cause of action can be brought based on excessive pricing of, of a patent, it could mean two things. It could mean that it is bringing a cause of action directly because of a determination that the price is, it, pricing is excessive relative to some efficient benchmark. Or it could mean uh, that there is something structural in the arrangement uh, of the patent licensing arrangement, the patent pool machine, uh, uh, machine that, was, um, that was mentioned, that could lead to pricing above competitive levels. But that's very different than saying that we deem this pricing to be excessive. The second approach is saying it puts you in a position to put prices above the market clearing price. And let me just illustrate the difference the way I see it uh, between the two approaches. In 1997, the DOJ issued a business review letter, uh, essentially granting this quasi-clearance that you get through business review through to the first MPEG LA patent pool, which has been phenomenally successful. And one of the reasons that the business review letter expressed 
um, a certain degree of comfort uh, about the collusion risk that's inherent to that arrangement was about one specific clause in the MPEG LA agreement between the licensor, amongst the licensors, which is a non-discrimination clause. That means that if you're a licensor in MPEG LA, you're also a licensee. And that structurally disciplines the pool from engaging in pricing that could, by some benchmark, deem to be excessive because every cent that you hike up the license is going to come out of your pocket as well. So that's my question. When, when, when you say excessive pricing, when you say abuse of dominance, are you talking about using antitrust law to regulate prices or are you talking about antitrust law to regulate the conditions under which pricing um, is made in the market? Thank you. Okay. Well, the, I did talk about uh, the problems about the, the licensing of the source start of essential patents. And I use the words like royalty stacking and the tragedy of anti-commons. Uh, from an economist viewpoint, I regard these problems as a, one good example of the so-called uh, prisoner's dilemma in the game theory. That is, uh, if the, those are patent owners, well, in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, in the, that the prisoners uh, could uh, communicate with each other and collaborate, then they would come up with a good solution. But because they cannot communicate and each of them pursue its own uh, maximum um, benefit, maximum profit, then it ends up with a very unfortunate situation, like uh, putting the prisoners actually into the prisons. Uh, so. Uh, the, the royalty stacking and the uh, tragedy of anti-commons is an example of that. If they could, uh, in a sense, uh, collaborate with each other, then they can come up with a, a fairly reasonable situation, but the, because each patent owner insists on its own uh, private gains, then uh, the license, uh, the standard cannot be adopted by the manufacturers, and everything would uh, become uh, a very unfortunate situation. That is a tragedy of anti-commons. So in that sense, uh, there is a, the patent pool, for instance, is a, a kind of collaborating among those uh, patent holders, and therefore it would create a, a, a better situation. Uh, so uh, uh, as I said, at least in the Japanese guidelines, uh, the, we do recognize, first of all, all of those uh, rather, uh, 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 you know, positive sides of those uh, patent pools, the, the collaborations. But the, but if the because it is a it can be a collaboration among the, the competitors that can create an anti-competitive situation as well, and therefore the balance between the two sides that's a difficult part. And that is uh, the thing that we are all concerned. And that's where, uh, actually, the, there is a room for the uh, competition also to set in. But the, as I said, it's sometimes very difficult to get a good balance between the two. Uh, and uh, as the, the chairman said, that the, uh, if those patent owners are the manufacturer themselves, then you know, they can have, they, they are the, both the patent holders and the users of the patents, and therefore they can consider uh, uh, both sides of the, the, the effects of those licensing, but uh, in certain cases, uh, it is often the case that the, the, some of the patent holders are non, uh, uh, the NEPs, non-exercising parties, and therefore they may not be the licensees, but they just want to maximize their license uh, uh, revenues. And that, in that kind of situation, the negative side may become more uh, prominent. And again, in there, it is difficult to apply the patent, the, the competition laws, but sometimes it is necessary, and it is often welfare improving to that uh, the authorities take certain actions against these kind of situations. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tan, would you like to? Um, 
<laughs> Thanks, Janice. I, I think uh, it's a tough question. I, I, I won't be able to differentiate uh, the, the two understandings myself. Um, but in the context of anti-monopoly law, excessive pricing is, is not just um, for uh, intellectual property. The anti-monopoly law, uh, there, there's a provision over there. Um, this is uh, Article 17, I think, uh, uh, provision one. Essentially, uh, it stipulate that um, selling product at unfairly high prices could be uh, a violation of the, of the law. So, so in that sense, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, in the context of uh, IP rights, okay? But then uh, the, the uh, guidelines I just mentioned, there's um, a provision 14, it, it does bring out excessive pricing again in the context of uh, intellectual property. So, so it did list a number of factors that I, I uh, listed before on my slides. So for example, how do you calculate the royalty rate, uh, that is a contributing factor. And to what extent the essential patent or intellectual property make uh, uh, valuable contributions to the product we're, we're uh, uh, reviewing. Uh, we're, okay, so, so the added value seems to be uh, one factor. And then uh, the other thing would be just uh, historical royalty rate and uh, Cross regions, whether you have a similar standard, so as, as I mentioned, it could be a price discrimination issue, and uh, do, do, do you put too much restrictions? I would say, uh, in the context of anti-monopoly law and also in the context of the IP rights, so far the agencies over there, uh, when they bring cases related to excessive pricing, it is typically associated with other practices. So, so I have not seen a case that essentially challenge undertaking simply just because of excessive pricing. So it is often associated with other practice such as uh, bundling, um, essential patent with non-essential patent, uh, bundling the current patent with expired patent, and uh, you could argue in this kind of context, one is price is too high and uh, stuff like that. So, so, so essentially uh, it's a combination of conduct that uh, got attention of the agencies and therefore, oh, since we have a provision here on the an anti-monopoly law and uh, we will talk about this. So, so as I mentioned earlier, if you do grant um, patent holder monopoly rights and the monopolist could design um, royalty contracts conditioned on whatever that is enforceable. So uh, I, I think as to what extent that's, that's a pro problem. And so this is a relevant uh, question. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sokol, you had your hand up. Um, with regard to IP guidelines, one issue that has emerged in some Asian jurisdictions is uh, essential facilities. So if we're a little skeptical on refusals to deal, we should perhaps be more skeptical about essential facilities. Uh, this is something we've seen particularly pronounced uh, in, in China. And also, I, I say a very interesting reading of uh, U.S. antitrust cases. So, um, uh, Jeff, you, you, you mentioned um, Aspen skiing. They, they view Aspen skiing as an essential facility case, even though while it was discussed in the Tenth Circuit opinion, it was certainly not discussed at all in the Supreme Court. You can go look at Otter Tail, the same kind of thing. They read that as an essential facilities case. At the lower court level, the district court, yes, but certainly the Supreme Court did do that. And actually, back to your point on Trinco, Trinco makes it very clear, at least with a dominant firm, the essential facility has never existed in the States. And, and, and Gofu, from your perspective, as, as former chief economist of the Canadian Competition Bureau, as you know, uh, the Canadian law also does not recognize essential facilities as such. How do we deal with what are real concerns about what um, what uh, aggressive use of an essential facilities like doctrine in the antitrust IP context might mean towards um, I innovation policy more broadly? And, and I guess Ian, you could also weigh in just from, from someone representing one of the two agencies of like, oh my God, we, you know, we, this is not the antitrust that we know in the States. <laughs> 
<laughs> so on, on the essential facilities, I, as, as you pointed out, and the courts have, in the U.S. have not really, uh, at least the Supreme Court certainly has not accepted essential facilities as a justification. <clears throat> and it d does very much go against kind of the holding of Trinco, um, and, and actually probably more so Linkline, um, where you, not only is it not an essential facility, but price squeeze uh, against a competitor isn't even uh, anti-competitive. So I, I think that I, we were just talking about excessive pricing. It, that is in the guidelines. That I, we're not going to assume a excessive price is an antitrust violation in and of itself. Um, and you can take qualms with that, but at least in the United States, I, being able to charge very, very high prices if you are doing so illegally, or legally, that is acceptable. And it, we have the, the tenant that um, you can get a monopoly by business acumen, historical accident, um, but you're allowed to have monopoly. It's okay. And you can take advantage of that monopoly to charge monopoly rents. Um, that is, that is a, probably um, one of the, the bigger differences between the United States antitrust law and, and uh, many of the other jurisdictions that we're dealing with. Uh, Dina? But from the press recently, we read that in China, NDRC seems to be very interested in pools and, and saying that pools are a big problem. Of course, I think in the U.S., their, their competitive benefits are recognized. If, if you can talk a little bit about pools, especially what the NDRC has been saying and anything you want to say, that'd be great. Thank you. I always say I don't have anything to say. <laughs> it's, um, I, I, I think... Uh, Pattern pool, as you said, I think in the U.S. context, we do recognize the benefits also from economics point of view. And now, I think what it meant in pattern pool is really in the essential standard pattern setting. And I think compared, as I mentioned earlier, compared with the two guidelines, the Chinese guidelines specifically single out how we should approach possible abuse in the context of the SEP. So uh, I think I'm, I'm reading uh, this guideline in front of me. Uh, when, when, they, when they talk about um, abuse of dominance in the context of uh, SEPs, they, they list five different factors that uh, they would like to uh, consider when evaluating a particular case. For, for example, uh, the the if you can measure the market value of a standard and the application scope and uh, also the uh, the degree that's the first factor that uh, they would like to evaluate if they whenever they have that information and the, the second one is uh, to what extent there exists uh, substitute standard or you know in other words to what extent this package is essential are, are there any substitution for any part of that so 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 this is a degree of substitution and also uh, switching costs is something that uh, they, they, they would like to look at. And moreover, the third factor they would like to consider uh, is um, to what extent the industry particularly relies on this standard or, or, or SEPs in this case. Uh, and how do we measure that, obviously, is one thing that uh, uh, it's important. So, so th th that's I missed the, the third fa factor they would like to look at. And um, moreover, they are interested in um, understanding the evolution of the patents over different generations and also to what extent there's a compatibility across generations. So that, that, that could um, m make a difference. And um, I mean, the other thing is essentially to what extent uh, each of the patent is essential. So th those are the issues. But, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly uh, whether they have any particular position, except uh, right now they have uh, a, a set of uh, uh, factors, conditions that uh, should be, or they, they hope the uh, Anti-Monopoly com Commission requires the agencies to uh, focus on. So that's how much I can say. But, but those are important issues, obviously. All right, but let me, uh, let me shift gears to, the, uh, to, to a US licensing issue to make, make sure we uh, uh, spread the questions um, evenly. 
Um, and, and something that, uh, that you said, Ian, in your remarks um, about international comedy issues and, and, and trying to reflect uh, the global supply chains, the fact we have such uh, closely related global supply chains into antitrust analysis, is there any interaction that uh, you could give us any insight into between what we're seeing in the IP licensing guidelines and in the revised international um, IP guidelines where there was an in indication, let's say interpreted by some, um, that the agency, uh, as, you, as you know, there's a circuit split in the interpretation of the FT AIA about the interpretation of proximate cause and the and extraterritorial reach of the, of the Sherman Act. Um, can you give us any, is there any interaction between those two guidelines, between a somewhat increased uh, willingness to contemplate pushing out the extraterritorial reach of the Sherman Act to reflect globalization and, 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 and IP licensing policy? <clears throat> So the, the guidelines themselves reference and, and encourage uh, readers to go back and look at the international uh, cooperation guidelines that were issued. And the guideline, the IP licensing guidelines are meant, not meant to stand alone uh, on their own. And they reference the, the horizontal merger guidelines, they represent the, uh, reference the international uh, cooperation guidelines. I think there is a recognition in this um, section within the, the new IP guidelines that there, the licenses tend to be very global because we now have so many technologies passing back and forth between uh, different countries. Um, and so <clears throat> we want to make sure we don't negatively, the U.S. laws are not allowed to negatively affect the way in which other uh, countries regulate their own uh, industries. But we, and especially in the criminal context where, and this is maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, the Nippon Paper case, where we started bringing in criminal cartels that uh, occurred outside the U.S. but had a very direct effect on the, the uh, U.S. marketplace. I think you're going to see um, a similar concern where you have a licensing that may be happening outside the U.S., but it's clear that the, the proximate effect is going to happen in the U.S., uh, and so that's what I think when they talk about uh, international comedy, they're going to take into account what actions the other governments are taking uh, in, on those licensing regimes, but also enforcing it and being cognizant of U.S. sovereignty and U.S. Uh, policy in, uh, involving uh, the licensing of rights within the U.S. Yes, I, I think that's an, that's an interesting new policy front to look at to the extent, obviously, that the, the U.S. consumer is the policy objective in a globalized world. You, you would expect to see um, some, some need to push out prudently to the, the, the extraterritorial reach of the, uh, of the Sherman Act. You don't need to respond. That's my, just my own view. Um, let, me, let me ask another question about the other thing that we're seeing in the in in the IP area in the in the M and A market, you have transactions that are 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 being driven by the IP assets, um, in which the core asset is an IP portfolio, mm -hmm. um, and again, following along the same lines here. Can you speak about any interaction between the IP guidelines and the horizontal merger guidelines? And what I'm pointing to specifically is the extent to which some of these IP monetization transactions, these grand IP portfolio transfers, um, to what extent could they implicate um, merger law rather than just, uh, than just IP licensing law or some interaction between the two? So the, the new IP guidelines did take into account some of the changes that occurred between the 1992 horizontal merger guidelines and the 2010 merger guidelines. Uh, you saw a w removal from the IP licensing guidelines, just as you had with the HMG, of the two-year entry horizon. It's much more flexible now. It takes into account that fa the fact that, especially in innovation and R&D markets, mm -hmm. you may be looking at an entry horizon that is five, six, seven years out. Um, and just because that you're looking at a much longer time frame doesn't mean that the anti-competitive effects that you would see in a merger may not still accrue. Uh, and so you've seen in cases like Teva Allergan, uh, the FTC put out 
a statement that accompanied the, the I think it was 79 product investors. Um, they also looked at innovation markets and they tried to figure out what, whether or not the, the transaction itself was going to harm innovation markets. And the, <clears throat> it's not directly on point to your, the, the, the rock star transactions and, and some of these big patent pooling transactions that the, uh, the DOJ and the FTC looked at uh, kind of early on in the, the 2000 teens. But <clears throat> I think the IP guidelines take the general position that property rights are property rights. IP rights are just a different form of property rights. And they're going to look in the merger context at what are the potential harms from the merger? Because remember, Section 7 has a very limited scope. You have to look at whether the merger itself is likely to substantially lessen competition. And so if you can use the, they've looked at the patent pooling, uh, excuse me, the um, patent aggregation issue and try to figure out, okay, is, is this new acquirer going to be able to use this huge patent portfolio to kind of beat up on other competitors? Um, one, one case where you did see the, in the merger context the FTC kind of try and address some of this is the Google Motor Mo Motorola Mobility settlement where there were restrictions and obligations placed on Google for the acquisition of that patent pool involving, and in that case it was SEPs. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see a, a market change from the way in which mergers are analyzed in a physical property uh, situation versus a uh, intellectual property situation. Great, thank you. Yes? Um, uh, I am Abdul Rupos, I teach at General Global Law School in India, and I have a question for, uh, yeah, is that, you know, I know you said that uh, it, uh, you were not there during the period when the guidelines were being made, so maybe it's difficult for you to answer the question. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, it's surprising that, that you know, uh, that the guidelines doesn't mention anything in terms of SEPs or mm -hmm. in spite of, uh, you know, uh, the Federal Circuit already, at least the Ericsson case was already out there, you know, the DOJ had publicly made a stand with its business review letters in terms of the activities. So there has been some sort of uh, movement from the department and, and which has had a negative reaction or whatever reaction from the community also. So don't you think that this was a lost opportunity where perhaps some indication as to what was going on in their mind because the, the guidelines actually sort of use the federal circuit as a benchmark in many of the other issues. Well, as you know, for this case, it does didn't. So, is there anything that? So, I, I will say I, I couldn't tell you what the conscious, I and mean, it was certainly a conscious decision not to include SEPs. Um, if you look at the commentators, I think Carl Shapiro, Joe Farrell, um, and Richard Gilbert all filed comments indicating that SEP should be addressed in the, uh, the revised uh, um, guidelines. And they filed that after the draft came out. And there had been a lot of press and, and pressure coming from the, the bar and uh, certainly from the IP bar um, on this very issue <clears throat> ahead of the guidelines being even released for, for public comment. I think there, there was an intention, intentional decision not to address that and rather rely on specific uh, in, uh, activities, either you can look at Google, Google Motorola Mobility, or um, about, I think it's three days or four days after the, uh, the guidelines were finally released in January of 2017, the FTC brought its Qualcomm case. Uh, and so, and that was an SEP case. But I, I think that you, I think they decided, or um, there was some reason why they decided that it was better to promulgate policy through their actions as opposed to actually create guidelines. What, I can't remember if it was uh, the AAG Renata Hesse or the acting uh, chairman who said it, but they determined that it was not appropriate to have a special set of rules for a set of IP rights. Uh, and that, so that may have gone into it as well. Hmm. That's interesting. Good. You mentioned Carl Shapiro, we met in this our keynote last year uh, down in Adelaide. Um, and uh, a point that came up uh, there, uh, and it's been exemplified in your presentation and uh, touched on by Professor Penn as well. Uh, these guidelines, and your question actually goes to that, sir, is that um, the guidelines, the way you've described them briefly, 
seem to sort of reiterate and affirm that uh, basically what they said before that is, is how you describe it is that this relationship and our view and the U.S. view of this relationship hasn't changed. Um, and that's important, as, actually. That's very important uh, as the, the, the specific point to get across that um, these are still seen as complementary and the application of competition to IP um, is seen as not different uh, to other areas. What um, has changed over that period is the influence of disruptive technology and the speed at which it works. Uh, Professor Tan mentioned um, uh, technology markets. He mentioned it as a different thing. It's not really a different thing from, say, something for, from a grocery market or a tangible good market. It's just how to quantify it, how to define it. Now, the, the, it's, I won't say it's the easy part to stand up and say, we haven't changed our view on this. That's actually like, a somewhat brave thing to do in the face of this. Has there been the same sort of work on how to define where you are, the situation, which is what's changed in a disruptive technology market? How do you define what the market is? How to define market power in that market that nobody's ever contemplated before? And then is there an abuse thereof? And that's the trick. So you don't have to reach out, as Professor Soko mentioned, to the edges of the legal mechanisms to try to figure out an answer, but it's really how to find yourself in the situation that one of said, how to find your way. Is that, where are we on that uh, sort of uh, scale? I'd ask anybody the answer to that. Well, the table's I'll, open. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the first crack at it. So <clears throat> actually, the, the US IP guidelines do reference three different potential markets to, to look at, types of markets, I should say. There's a technology market, which was uh, referenced. Uh, there's an R&D market. And then there's the product market itself. Uh, and where the disruptive technologies fit into one of those three markets, I think, may depend somewhat on what, wh how developed the technology is. Um, and then it may, and, and then how it manifests in the marketplace. Um, so and if you go back 10 years uh, and you look at MySpace, uh, MySpace was was dominant, and everybody there nobody questioned MySpace was the dominant uh, social networking uh, until Facebook crushed it, um, and then there Twitter was was the dominant, and then WhatsApp came on, and then Snapchat came on, and and so I think one of the concerns potentially with having very rigid guidelines is you can't account for the fact that you're not going to, your marketplace as you define it in 2017, the market may not exist in 2019, let alone look the same. Uh, and I think they wanted to make sure, and, and uh, to your uh, point on, it's the, I guess the bravery of saying, we don't need to change anything, is that they have seen that the flexibility that the 1995 guidelines built in through now three different administrations still adheres um, and is still worthwhile to continue to enforce um, using this broad framework that promotes cross-licensing, that promotes strong IP rights, but acknowledges the potential anti-competitive abuses that are inherent in a system that grants somebody a monopoly. Well, I, I guess um, I, I I think um, my understanding is that uh, if you look at the guideline, there's actually a U.S. guideline. There's a footnote 33 saying that uh, it, when intellectual property is often licensed, sold, or transferred as an integral part of a market good. So that's what I mean uh, when I say if the IP and the product are complement or perfect complements, so they often go together. In that situation, obviously, we don't necessarily have to define technology markets separately. But on the other hand, sometimes one IP could be used for a bunch of other goods, or some goods could, we have to incorporate other uh, license and IP, so, so then you get a separation. So the degree of separation between IP uh, 
and the good that you use that IP matters. And that separation also depends on how competitive, how much substitution at each layer, each level, uh, that will determine whether we should uh, define technology market separately or not. That, that, that's my understanding. Now, you know, when you talk about disruptive technology, what has changed? Even when we define technology markets or R&D markets separately, we could still follow the tradition, or the previous guidelines. So in, in other words, the principles are still there. It's just that maybe because of uh, IP features, we have to uh, separate in order for us to evaluate certain practices. That's my general understanding. But the overall frameworks, I think, is still the same. And the last word from Commissioner Odagiri. Well, in terms of the uh, distinction between the technology market and the product market, I just uh, agree with uh, the other speakers. Uh, as long as all, all the patent holders are the manufacturers themselves, then uh, these two markets are probably, all, in almost all the cases, they are the same things. Uh, at least the participants of the market are the same uh, members. But uh, when there are those uh, non-practicing entities in PEs, then uh, uh, the coverage of the technology market can be broader than the, the, the product market. Uh, but uh, now, regarding your question about the disruptive technologies, uh, well, the point is that uh, we just cannot predict what's going to happen with those technologies, right? <laughs> so. Uh, ah. This is my personal opinion, but the, it is more dangerous to make any prediction and uh, make decision based on that rather than just uh, look at the current situation and uh, not care about the futures. So uh, in that sense, uh, uh, my own feeling is that the, the competition authority uh, should be uh, very conservative or careful about uh, applying uh, uh, things to those uh, disruptive things. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for uh, uh, insightful presentations and comments. And um, I think the coffee break is next. Yeah, thank you.